Welcome back, everyone, to another reaction video. Well, uh, this one came out a while ago, and I know my friend Mr. Terry did a reaction to it a while back, and I'm just now getting to it myself, but uh, I feel like I have a pretty good uh, perspective to be able to offer on this one. It's called The Story of the Entire Bible, I guess, and it's obviously uh, modeled after the Bill Wirtz video, the very famous video, History of the Entire World, I guess, which is my most viewed reaction video that I've ever had. Uh, and so I'll put the link in the description to the original content creator. You can check that out without my commentary. Just a heads up as we get into this one, how I'm going to be approaching it, because obviously we know that religion can be a sensitive subject. And I realize that uh, our audience is made up of people with a variety of belief systems who are all most welcome here. Uh, I, of course, am not only a Christian, but a, a pastor. Uh, so I'm going to be approaching this uh, my commentary is going to be based on what this is, which is this is telling the story of the Bible. I'm going to be responding with my commentary in that way. Uh, this is not about debating the truth of the Bible, the, the historical accuracy of the Bible. This is just about the content of the Bible. So whether you feel it's completely fantasy, it's 100% true, somewhere in between, I'm just commenting on what's actually there not whether it's true or not, those kinds of things. So uh, with that in mind, I want to give a shout out and a thank you to Brent from Lebanon, Pennsylvania. I've got friends in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, so that's cool. I know right where that is. Been there many times. Uh, and Gustavo in Villa Real, Portugal. Thank you so much for your support on Patreon. Let's go ahead and dive into this one. Hi, you live on Earth. It's got a lot of cool stuff in it, but why is it there? The Bible has a story to tell. In the beginning, before there was anything, before there was anywhere, before there was any when, there was God who is everywhere and every when. He is isness itself, and he has everything, so he doesn't even need to create the world. Yeah, so that's a pretty cool way of presenting that he is isness, uh, because there's actually um, there's a statement that God makes in the Bible. It's I am, and it's in capital letters, and it basically is a way of expressing that, that eternal nature of God, right? And this is a concept that... It's hard for us to wrap our minds around because for us, everything has a beginning and an end, right? There's a beginning to a life. There's an end to a life. Uh, even uh, scientifically speaking, if we're talking about the universe, people talk about the Big Bang as being kind of the beginning of it. And at some point there will be an end to it. So the idea of something being eternal is kind of outside of that. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Interstellar, you know, you kind of get a little glimpse of that kind of fifth dimension type stuff where you're talking about existing outside of time. And, and that's the nature of God. Omnipotent, omnipresent. So everywhere at once, more powerful than everything and always existing. But God still created the world. Wait, no, it didn't look like that at first. It was more formless and void and very dark. But God let there be light. So now there's light. And this light stuff is pretty good, so God separated it from the darkness. And we should give these things names. Good news, the water below is now separated from the water above. Even more good news, now there's dry land. And guess what? Now there's life. Just plants for now. But the plants might have cleaned up the air, so now you can see the sun, moon, and stars. That's going to be very useful. So this is all coming directly from the creation story in the book of Genesis. Um, Old Testament mostly written in Hebrew. Some parts of it written in Aramaic. Most of the New Testament then is going to be written in Greek. There's animals but in the water. Modern There's animals in the air. There's animals on the land. And now it's time for God's coolest creation so far. God made a human person called Adam and gave him an awesome garden, but he was still lonely, so God gave him a wife. These two kinds of humans are made out of the same stuff, but also different so they can have a relationship. God gave them a lot of trees, but two big important ones. They're allowed to eat from this one because if they do, they're going to live forever. But God told them not to eat from this one because if they do... They die. Seems like a pretty obvious choice, right? So, yeah, and uh, this is, of course, the origin of sin is what it's going to talk about here. And a lot of people will ask the question, well, why create such a thing in the first place? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's called. And it was not an apple. There's no indication it was an apple. I don't know where that came from, but it says nothing like that in the Bible. Might not have even been a fruit that we know today. Um, but really this is a test this is a test of obedience this is a way of saying okay i've basically given you everything you need everything you want i'm only asking you to not do one thing and of course humans being humans as soon as you tell them you can't do that what's the thing we want to do that 
actually, said some snake who's actually the devil, God doesn't want you to eat from this tree because you're going to become like him, and he doesn't want you to get too powerful. Okay, said Eve. Okay, said Adam. So they ate from the tree, and just like that, humanity had failed God's requirements for them. They lost access to the tree of life, which means they're going to end up dying. So now this is about cause and effect, right? Don't do this or else this will happen. And in the story in the uh, book of Genesis, the serpent says to Eve, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? He kind of twists the words, right? And then Eve's like, well, no, he only said we can't eat from that one tree. Oh, well, he said that because he knows if you do that, you'll be just like him. And so there's that doubt. There's that questioning of the authority that you've been given. And uh, and the, the word Satan, actually, Satan's not his name. It actually means accuser. It means like, you know, it basically is his role rather than his name, so to speak. It's kind of like when you call somebody dad. Dad is not their name. It's who they are. Humanity had sided with Satan over God, losing all rights to the life that God gave them. So nobody could blame God if he ended humanity right then and there. But God didn't do that. God promised one day Satan would be destroyed by one of their kids. But Adam and Eve already sinned, so let's see. Yeah, and so that's actually the first uh, prophecy we have about the coming of a Messiah in the New Testament. And it's all throughout the Old Testament uh, where he talks about uh, one that will be born of woman that would come and, and uh, crush the serpent's head under his heel. And that's a direct reference to... Uh, to a redeemer that would come to set right what was made wrong in that moment. And another interesting thing that uh, not a lot of people talk about in the Old Testament is in the creation story, uh, God says, let us make man in our image. And so that's a direct indication that God is not alone in the moment that he makes uh, man, mankind. And, and so uh, some people believe, as I do, that that is a reference to the kind of trinitarian nature of god god you know father son holy spirit three in one another one of those concepts that doesn't make a lot of sense to people myself included um but it also could be a reference to other eternal beings like angels for example if their kids can do any better cain is mad at his brother abel because abel's better at having faith in god god tells cain he needs to resist sin and cain kills his brother why'd he do that well you see the problem of adam's sin was passed down to cain because yep. the problem affects all of humanity so as humans multiply, sin and evil multiply. Enough of this. God chooses the least evil guy, a guy named Noah. He's still a sinner, but he has faith in God, so he's a relative. So that's an important thing to note there, right, is that Noah was not perfect. And this is multiple generations. Uh, we're talking, uh, if you use the biblical timeline, we're talking um, a couple thousand years into all of this. Um and it says, the first reference to Noah, it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, and basically what it was was that while other people were just completely diving headfirst into their sin, Noah, while also sinful, at least was attempting to be faithful to God. Relatively decent guy compared to everyone else. God tells them to build a boat for him and his family, and everyone laughs at them until God makes a huge flood that kills everyone except them. But once the flood passes, God makes the rain. So a couple theories about all of this. There's one theory that there was something called a water canopy. And there's some scientific, listen, I'm not a scientist, um, but I've read that there are some scientific hypotheses about this actually being a real thing at some point, a water canopy that, um, you know, when it talked in Genesis about separating the waters above the earth from the waters on the earth, that maybe it was actually kind of this greenhouse effect that kept the entire planet at relatively the same temperature and humidity to where it didn't even need to rain. So maybe rain had never even happened before at this point. This is all conjecture, of course, and um, there's no way to prove any of it, just like there's no way to prove the Big Bang. You can look at evidence and you can say, okay, based on the evidence, this is what we think happened. But because you can't replicate it and you can't observe it, you can never prove it. Um, but the collapse of that water canopy does a couple of things, the theory anyway goes. Number one, it's a very quick way of the, of the earth flooding. It's when we start getting seasons. It's when the, the poles get colder and the center of the earth gets warmer. Uh, and we see evidence of this, right? You can go up to places like Canada under the ice and you can find tropical plants. Uh, so there does seem to be some evidence that the earth was much more even in temperature at some time. Uh, but it also, if you think about it, in the Bible, after the flood, people stop living seven, eight, nine hundred years in the biblical accounts, and they start living 
80 to 100, 120 years, and then eventually down to 60 or 70. Uh, and if this water canopy did exist, maybe it's protecting uh, mankind from the ultraviolet rays of the sun, which is one of the main reasons why we age the way that we do. Uh, so again, not a scientist, just throwing all of that out there as kind of a way of looking at all of this. Though the sign of his covenant. Remember that promise that Satan's going to be destroyed? God adds to it, saying he's not going to destroy the world again until then. Because now people are going to have some basic decency. God's not fixing the world yet, but he's making it a stable enough place so that mm. he can do that in the future. It's a good way of looking at it. So now people are not quite as evil as they were before. They're good enough that they can work together in society, but evil enough that they're going to use that to build a huge tower up to God out of their own pride. And tower of Babel, and we have a pretty good idea of where this may have been. It's actually a big empty field now. Uh, but there's some archaeological research that's been done into this, and they think they know where it may have been. Evil people are dangerous when they're given too much power. So God makes the whole tower thing fail by dividing everyone's language. So maintenant, le monde ne peut pas travailler ensemble. So now people are divided into different nations, and these nations each have their own gods. But wouldn't it be cool if there was one nation specifically devoted to... Yeah, that's all true. And one of the interesting things about all of these nations, and, and we're told in the Bible that it was during the man, the life of a man named Peleg, P-E-L-E-G, that God divided the earth. Uh, so is that a, a reference to Pangaea being separated? Is it just a reference to the division of languages? We don't know. But uh, it is interesting that a couple of things happen uh, that we know historically happened. Number one, pretty much every continent on earth has a society that has a flood myth, right? Um, one of the earliest known stories that we have written is the Epic of Gilgamesh, which includes a flood. So uh, the story of Noah and the flood is hardly the only written account or story that we have in a culture of there being a flood that destroyed part or all of the earth. Pretty much every culture has that. That tells me something happened at some point, whether you believe the biblical account or some other account, something happened that everybody has that story. There's also something, and I want to actually take a look at this real quick so I get it right. There's something that happened called the 4.2 kilo year event, right? Uh, it's one of the most se severe climactic events to exist, starting around 2200 BC based on the evidence and lasted an entire century. Uh, caused the collapse of the Old Kingdom of Egypt, the Akkadian Empire in Mesopotamia, the Langju culture in the Yangtze River area, the Indus River, uh, Valley civilization. All of these civilizations all around the world, you see North America, South America, Africa, uh, Europe, uh, Asia, all around this time, it says the hatched areas that you see there were affected by wet conditions or flooding and the dotted areas by drought or dust storms. Big chunks of the world around 2200 BC, 4200 years ago, experienced some kind of disaster that destroyed civilizations. Just saying. So again, my point in all of this is not to say that the Bible, that you actually absolutely have to believe the Bible's true, but it's based on stuff that we know did happen in some way. Uh, so take from that what you want. To the one true God. So God chose Abraham to be the father of his people. And God updated the covenant saying that God's going to make a nation that he's going to use to fix the world. God promised Abraham he's going to have as many kids as the stars in the sky. And Abraham was like, how's that going to be possible? My wife is super old. But Abraham still had faith in God. I, I like the little dramatic pause right there. My wife is super old. But while he has faith in God's covenant, he also kind of takes matters into his own hands a little bit. We'll see if he talks about that. So does that mean he's the chosen one who's going to defeat Satan? Well, sadly, no, because Abraham still sinned by telling the king that his wife was really his sister. But they do have kids. This one struggled with God, so he got... But they didn't just have those kids. Abraham, like so many of us throughout... Uh, history decided to take matters into his own hands he's like well god promised me a son but sarah's old she's not having a son anytime soon so sarah gives her slave girl hagar to abraham and says have a son with her she's younger she'll produce a child and their child is ishmael and ishmael becomes the ancestor of the arabs and it's through him that you're then going to have islam being born right uh, as a different son of Abraham. And, and there's this clash to this day between the descendants of Isaac and the descendants of Ishmael. 
got the name Israel, which means struggled with God. And his children are going to become the 12 tribes of Israel. He struggled with God because sin is still a problem. If you think your family is bad, this one was so dysfunctional that they sent Joseph to slavery in Egypt. Yeah, they do. They sell him into slavery, and then they tell their dad that he was killed. Um, they present him the coat of many colors with blood on it. And Joseph had been kind of the favorite, even though he was younger. And there's a whole story behind why that was. Uh, because Israel had a couple of different wives. He had to marry two sisters. And the, the younger sister was the one he really wanted. Her name was Rachel and all this stuff. But um, yeah, it's uh, here's the thing about the Bible. A lot of people say that when the Bible says something happened, that that's God sanctioning it. And that's not the case. Uh, polygamy exists in the Bible. God never directly says it's totally okay for you to have a bunch of wives. Uh but it happened. Just because it happened doesn't mean it was okay. A lot of godly people did some pretty ungodly things. But while he was there, God gave him the ability to protect Egypt from starving to death. So now Egypt loves Joseph, and in a great act of forgiveness, Joseph invited the rest of his family back to live with him in Egypt. So God was glorified through his people by turning a bad thing into a good thing. At first, Egypt likes the Israelites, but when they multiply a lot, Egypt stops liking them and enslaves them instead. Moses is one of the Israelites, and when he sees an Egyptian beating another Israelite, he kills the Egyptian. Come on, Israelites, let's rise up. Bro, you're gonna get us in trouble. So Moses has to flee Egypt, and he moves to the middle of nowhere, joins a sheep farm, gets married, and lives happily ever after. But one day, God appears to Moses in a burning bush, saying it's finally time for the Israelites to have that land God promised them. So God tells Moses to tell the leader of Egypt to let his people go. And so Moses, uh, according to the biblical story, has uh, been raised by Pharaoh's daughter. So he's definitely got a connection to the Egyptian royal family. There's no evidence he was ever raised as a prince in Egypt, though he certainly could have been. Um, and even his name Moses is an Egyptian name. Um, but uh, it has to do with him being drawn out of the water. And uh, that's a whole story, too, that we won't get into. But he definitely probably had some kind of previous relationship with Pharaoh to, whether, to where he would have known. And uh, contrary to popular belief, there's no evidence. In fact, the evidence points away from Ramses II being the Pharaoh of uh, the Exodus. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that points to another man being, uh, I think it was Tutmosis III. Let me double check. Okay, I was way off. It was Amenhotep II, and there's a whole bunch of explanations to why he fits the narrative of Exodus uh, in terms of all of the little key components. If you lay out, okay, here are all the criteria based on Exodus uh, of who the pharaoh of the Exodus has to be. Amenhotep II is the only one who really fits all of those things. 15th century seems to work pretty well. Later on in the Bible, you're going to hear see a description of King Solomon's reign. Uh, when he starts building the temple, it's like 480 years after the Exodus, which um, Solomon's going to be reigning in like like around 970 BC, which puts it perfectly within Amenhotep II's reign. But again, all of that is predicated on the idea of, of believing that the biblical narrative has basis in truth. So a lot of you may not feel that way. So Moses goes back to Egypt and tells Pharaoh, let my people go. No, but God gives Moses the ability to cause plagues in Egypt. Let my people go, or the river turns to blood. No. Or you get frogs everywhere. No. Gnats. No. Flies. No. Dead livestock. No. Boils. No. Hail. No. Locusts. No. Darkness. No. Let us go, or your firstborn sons will die. No. But then the firstborn sons die, so the Pharaoh's like, okay, fine, you can leave. So the Israelites set out for the Promised Land, but when they're about halfway there, Egypt changes its mind and sends the army after them to bring them back. They corner them by the Red Sea. We've got you surrounded. Oh yeah, says Moses, watch this. So the waters of the Red Sea part, the Israelites escape, but when the Egyptians try to follow them, they unpart and they all die. On their journey, they take a rest stop at Mount Sinai so God can give them the law for when they live in the Promised Land. Moses will go up to the top of the mountain to receive the law, so he says, don't worship any false gods while I'm gone. You had one job. Bro, I'm bored. Let's worship some false gods. And, and it's Moses' brother Aaron who gets involved in this and helps them make this golden calf that they worship. And Moses comes down the mountain, throws the tablets down, they get broken, and that whole story. So they make a golden calf and worship it. Meanwhile, on the top of the mountain, the presence of God descends upon the mountain, and Moses receives the law on stone tablets, including the Ten Commandments. But when Moses goes back down and sees the Israelites worshiping a uh, important little note of, like thing I want to note tablets including real, the ten real quick here. Number six, don't murder. 
It's not thou shalt not kill. It's thou shalt not murder. Big difference. Commandments. But when Moses goes back down and sees the Israelites worshiping a false god, he gets so mad he smashes the stone tablets. So he goes back up the mountain and gets new stone tablets. And God adds to the covenant, saying he's going to give the people the law and the land if they're faithful to the covenant. So let's see how faithful they're going to be. The people are approaching the promised land, but the evil Canaanites already live there. They have strong fortresses and big scary soldiers, and the Israelites are going to have to fight them to take over the land. Come on guys, be brave. God's going to be with you. No, we're too afraid. So the Israelites turn away, they don't invade the land, which means they did not have faith in God's covenant. Yeah, and this is the story all throughout the rest of the Old Testament is Israel's repeated unfaithfulness to God. It's them repeatedly turning away from God, going to false idols, going to other religions, marrying with other groups and bringing their culture in, um, wanting to do their own thing, wanting a king because everybody else has a king, all that sort of stuff. Um, and there's a story here that 12 spies are sent in to spy out the land and two of them are Joshua and Caleb. Uh, but the other 10 come back and say, they're powerful. There's no way we can do this. It's nuts. And Joshua and Caleb are like, oh, it's a great land. We can absolutely do this. And, and it just goes to show you that different people can see the exact same things, have the same information and come back with a completely different perspective based on their existing worldview, based on their belief system, all that stuff. Two of us can look at the same thing and see it completely differently. So their punishment is they have to wander around the Sinai desert for 40 years. But what about Moses? He didn't do anything wrong. So maybe he's the chosen one who's going to defeat Satan? Well, no, Moses still sinned by doing a miracle the wrong way. So his punishment is he's going to die before he gets to enter the promised land. And doing a miracle the wrong way, he did it out of anger. He did it out of frustration. This is hardly his only sin. Uh, but that was the sin that keeps him from being able to enter the promised land. But then the next generation of Israelites, led by Joshua, does enter the land, uses trumpets to smash the city of Jericho, and drives out the rest of the Canaanites. Cool, now we finally have our land. They have found the city of Jericho. It's one of the oldest known inhabited cities on earth. Uh, and there is some pretty significant evidence of a destruction that fits along the lines of what was described. Um in the Bible. Same thing goes with the uh, places where the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were. There seems to be some evidence of something happening that fits along the story of the Bible. So again, those things definitely happened. Did they happen the way the Bible describes them is really the debate we have to have. We know Jericho was destroyed. We know that there were cities of Sodom and Gomorrah that were destroyed probably by some kind of fire from heaven. It could have been a comet or a meteor or something. And and you could argue that, well, maybe the biblical description of how, how and why Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed is invented based on what actually happened. So those are the debates we have, right? We have the evidence archaeologically, then we have the biblical story, and some people are going to reconcile them and say, well, the biblical story perfectly explains these things because that's what happened. Or others might argue, well, the biblical story is the way that people who didn't really know why and how things happened were trying to explain it. And but who's going to rule us? So God appoints judges to rule over the people and defend them from the enemy nations. Because during this time, there's a pattern that goes something like this. There's peace in the land, but then people get lazy and forget about God. So God lets their enemies yep. conquer them, but then people turn back to God. So God strengthens them to reconquer their land, and there's peace in the land again. I gotta say that this guy, I don't really, I'm not real familiar with the guy who made this, but he, he's doing a really good job of explaining this stuff. Uh, and this is a perfect way of describing basically the rest of the Old Testament uh, is this cycle. Exactly. Again. This pattern repeats many, many times with many, many different judges, and people are starting to get sick of it. Bro, why can't we just have a king? Trust me, you don't want a king, says Samuel. Come on, everyone else has a king. Okay, fine, says Samuel, but the king's going to be oppressive. So Samuel anoints Saul as king, and sure enough, Saul is an oppressive ruler. You know who would be a better ruler? This young kid, David. He's just a shepherd and a string player, so no one takes him seriously. But one day, a huge, scary caveman warrior, Goliath, shows up to fight the Israelites. Okay, guys, who wants to fight Goliath? I'll do it, says David. So David takes out his slingshot. And the story is that David, who is a shepherd, who's the youngest in his family, has uh, come to the army to deliver food to his brothers who are in the army. And he overhears Goliath taunting the Israelites 
uh, and is just indignant that no one has the faith in God to be able to face Goliath. And so he goes out and defeats Goliath. Shot hits Goliath in the head with a rock and kills him. So now David's a hero and everyone loves David and Saul is getting pretty jealous of David. Especially because all the girls are chanting, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. So Saul wants to kill David. So David flees and Saul pursues him. But and we're told in the, the narrative that Saul basically has what you could describe as a mental health issue where he descends into depression and, and violent fits of rage to where he even at one point wants to kill his own son, Jonathan, uh, for being friends with David. And so he kind of goes back and forth between, oh, David, you're my best friend. I would never do anything to hurt you. You're like a son to me. And David, I want to kill you. And this kind of goes back and forth for a long period of time. One day, David gets a golden opportunity to kill Saul while he's using the bathroom, but he doesn't, so Saul forgives David. But one day, Saul dies to avoid being captured, so David becomes the next king. This is awesome. It starts out really well, and David gains a lot of victories for his kingdom. Maybe he's the chosen one that's going to defeat Satan. Except no, David sins because he likes this one woman, so he has her husband killed in battle so he can steal her. Yeah, and she's going to be the mother of Solomon, who's going to succeed him. And there's an important thing to point out here, because I've seen people, in light of what's going on right now in the news in this part of the world, talk about David built Jerusalem. No, he didn't. If you read the narrative in the Old Testament, David conquered Jerusalem from the Jebusites. Uh, his capital had been in Hebron, I think, for the first seven years of his reign. Then he conquers, it, conquers Jerusalem, makes it his new capital. Uh, but he did not build Jerusalem. So God makes everything go downhill for David after that. But God still promises that one of David's descendants will be the king that he couldn't be, have a kingdom that covers the entire world and lasts forever. So let's add this to the covenant. Maybe David's son Solomon can do it. He's off to a great start, asking God for wisdom and then writing down a bunch of wise sayings, which impresses all the kings and queens of the earth who want to learn from Solomon. And furthermore, Solomon builds a huge, beautiful temple to glorify God. It's really not that big when you read the descriptions of it. It's like, I don't know, 40, 50 feet wide, 60 feet long, pretty high. Um, it's nothing like the later temple that will be built on that site, but it still takes a number of years to complete and tens of thousands of workmen. There's very detailed descriptions uh, in, I think it's in First Kings, of the exact dimensions of the temple, the exact decorations, the exact way that it was laid out, the number of workers that were involved and, and where they came from. They talk about King Hiram of Tyre um, uh, up in modern day Lebanon, where he gets a lot of the, the wood for all of this, the way that it's all laid out. It, it's really quite fascinating the level of detail we get in some of these descriptions. So right now his kingdom is a shining beacon of light to the world and God is glorified through his people. So maybe Solomon's that future king who's going to rule the entire world. Except no, Solomon sins by having a bunch of wives and mistresses, some of whom are not Israelite, so Solomon ends up worshipping foreign yep. gods, and then everything goes downhill for Solomon as well. And after this, things kind of went downhill for the kingdom as a whole because people kept sinning more. The kingdom split into Israel and Judah, and both kingdoms got evil kings who worshipped pagan gods. But it's not like everything was bad during this time period, because a lot of great prophets arose who encouraged people to turn back to God, and even when the temple was literally being used as a place of demon worship, God never told the prophets to abandon the temple, but instead to restore, revive, and retake the temple. And there were actually some good kings who listened to them and reformed... And, and that the temple then becomes kind of a, a model of humanity too, right? Is that um, rather than destroy humanity again, he wants to redeem it. He wants to fix it. He wants to restore it. Um and that's and there are a lot of uh, analogies that are used in this time. For example, you've got um, the prophet Hosea, who uh, it's a fascinating story. So Hosea is told to marry this woman, Gomer, who's a prostitute. And God says, oh, by the way, she's going to keep being unfaithful to you the whole time. But I want you to keep taking her back and uh, and forgiving her. And And the whole thing is basically this picture of God's relationship with his people where his people are repeatedly prostituting themselves to other gods but God keeps taking them back anyway the temple encouraging people to remember God's covenant but even with all this eventually Israel was eaten by Assyria Judah was eaten by Babylon they smashed the temple and the Israelites were carried off to exile 
Eventually, Persia got a nice king who let the Israelites go back to their land, and even gave them money to rebuild their temple. Maybe now it's finally time for that eternal kingdom. So they're rebuilding the temple. Yo, this is gonna be so great! I don't know, man. It's just not like it was before. They were kind of disappointed that it wasn't time for the eternal kingdom yet, but they still had faith in God's covenant that that was going to happen eventually. And the prophet started focusing a lot on this future king, yep. giving him names like Messiah, or the Son of Man. Daniel said that this kingdom would outlast all the other kingdoms. Micah said this king would be born in Bethlehem. Isaiah said this king would suffer for the sins of his people. And Zechariah said God will send God to live with us. Does that mean this king is going to be God? Yeah, so, and, you know... Like a lot of prophecies, they're open to interpretation. And so as people are waiting for this Messiah, they've got all sorts of ideas of what that's going to look like. Uh, and most people think that, especially once the Romans come in, that he's going to be there to deliver them from the Romans. And um, they, they really just don't have any idea. Everyone's wondering about this Messiah. When is he going to come and who is he going to be? An Israelite woman named Mary sees an angel who says she's going to have a baby. The baby's going to be... Okay. All right. All right. I got to take exception with this here. An Israelite woman named Mary sees an angel who... Come on, Gabriel. At least get it right. It's why are you apostrophe R-E. Who says she's going to have a baby. The baby's going to be a king, just like his ancestor David, and his kingdom is never going to end. Bro, I'm literally a virgin. That's okay. The Holy Spirit will give you a baby, so your baby is literally going to be the son of God. All right, so Mary gives birth to Jesus in a manger in Bethlehem and calls him Emmanuel, which means God with us. I think there was a prophecy about that. Yep. And three wise men show up to the party because of a star. It never says there were three of them uh, and also never says they were kings. We talk about we three kings, right? No evidence they were kings. It says they were magi from the east. It doesn't say there were three magi from the east. There were three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There could have been 20 magi. There could have been two magi. Or that they saw. Hi, is this where the king was born? We have some presents for him. But then Herod heard that. It also never says they went to the manger scene. This is another really irritating thing I have. It says that they went to a house where the family was staying. So it could have been two weeks, could have been up to two years after. Uh, because we know that Herod orders all the babies under two years old to be born. And uh, But they were in a house. That a great king was just born in Bethlehem. King of Israel, you say? I'm the only king around here. I think there was a prophecy about this. So King Herod got really jealous and ordered people to go to Bethlehem to kill this new baby king. So Mary and her husband Joseph had to flee Bethlehem and go to Egypt until it was safe to come back. I think there was a prophecy about this. When Jesus grows up, his first miracle is actually making wine for a party because his mom told him to. But his real and ministry... And there's a lot of cultural significance to that. These uh, wedding parties lasted like going on like a week. And so you had to have enough wine for the entire thing. And it was a big deal if you ran out and could be sh bring shame on your family for a generation. Um, so there's a lot to that. Uh, but we're not here to kind of break down every little story. It doesn't start until he's baptized by John the Baptist. John the Baptist is a guy in the wilderness who His baptizes cousin. people and tells them to turn back to God. I think there was a prophecy about this. But when Jesus is baptized, God declares that Jesus is his son and sends the Holy Spirit upon him. Right after that, Jesus went into the desert and ate nothing for 40 days. And that's when Satan tried to tempt Jesus to sin, but he didn't sin. Up until now, John the Baptist was preaching about the kingdom of God, but then he went to jail. So Jesus takes over, which makes sense because he's actually the king. So what's the kingdom of God like? Jesus said the kingdom of God brings liberation to the oppressed and is good news for poor people, not just rich people. That those And that's a quote from the Old Testament where he talks about, I have come to declare freedom to the captives, to um, you know, declare good news for the poor and uh, sight, recovery of sight to the blind, all this stuff. He's, he's quoting, Jesus reads this uh, prophecy in the temple and he says today that this prophecy is fulfilled in your presence. Those who are poor and sad now are going to inherit the entire world, and that this kingdom is the fulfillment of everything God promised. But he doesn't just tell people what the kingdom of God is, he shows them by casting out demons, healing the sick, and forgiving people's sins. He's going on tour through all the towns in the land, doing all sorts of miracles, and everyone is amazed, except the people from his hometown, because it's embarrassing that they knew him as a kid. Yeah, uh, and that's that's true, right? I, I actually interviewed to be the youth minister at the church I grew up in, and I was really 
kind of uncomfortable with the idea and I think they probably were too because they knew me when I was a kid and it's difficult to go into a place where people knew you as a kid and have any kind of spiritual authority and be seen as you know somebody that's meant to lead uh, so I get that totally um, if you want to see a fantastic portrayal of uh, these stories uh, of the New Testament uh, the chosen is fantastic Jesus chose 12 helpers, and more and more people became his followers. A lot of people loved Jesus, but some people who did not love him were the Pharisees. They were obsessed with following all the rules, hoping to impress God so of they them. would give back their kingdom. Because right now, the Israelites, or I guess now... The only reason I know that is because my daughter's boyfriend's Jewish, so I get all the scoop on all that stuff. ...Jews were living under the Roman Empire, which was run by Gentiles, which are people who are not Jewish people. And the Pharisees were hoping to bring back the kingdom of Israel, but Jesus' kingdom seemed to be about something different. They didn't like how Jesus hung out with sinners, forgave other people's sins, welcomed Gentiles, told them to pay taxes to Rome, and challenged their authority. So they thought Jesus was not the real Messiah. But then one day... On the and there had been other people who had come forward who had claimed to be the Messiah throughout the years. Jesus was hardly the first one to come along like that top of a mountain, Jesus was transfigured in front of other people, and Moses and Elijah, big important people from the Old Testament, appeared next to him. So that made the Pharisees look really stupid. So when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the most important city where the temple was, he was greeted like a king with people waving palm tree branches. And people were even worshipping Jesus, which made the Pharisees really mad. Yeah. Everyone knows you're only supposed to worship God. So if Jesus is accepting worship, either he's God or he's blaspheming. And I think you know which one the Pharisees went with. Yep. So they plotted to kill Jesus. Jesus was predicting this. That's so one of the things that has always bothered me about the idea that people say, well, he was a, he was a good guy who um, said a lot of good things, but he wasn't God. Well, if the Gospels are accurate in portraying the words of Jesus and the actions of Jesus, then that's not really an option. He either was God or he was crazy and a sinner and deserved to die according to their law he summoned all his disciples for one last supper he took bread and wine saying the bread was his body and the wine was his blood and we should do this in remembrance of him and he made a new covenant promising forgiveness of sins and he said that one of the disciples would betray him sure enough this one betrayed jesus by helping people arrest him he did it because he was paid to some of the other disciples tried... And, and I would say, I would take it a step further. Judas, I think, and this is just my own personal opinion as I'm kind of reading between the lines of the of the story. Um, I think Judas really did believe in Jesus. I think Judas was impatient. I wonder if Judas wasn't just trying to force Jesus' hand. All right, you know, G, you know, he kind of maybe was one of those people who felt like Jesus was supposed to deliver them from the Romans and it wasn't happening fast enough. And he was getting frustrated. And so he kind of put Ju Jesus in a position that he knew he could get out of if he would just show his power to everyone. And then he didn't do it. And I think that's what leads Judas to take his own life is the guilt of knowing that it didn't work out the way he thought it would. I had to fight back, but Jesus told them not to do that because this all needs to happen. Jesus was handed over to the Roman soldiers led by Pontius Pilate, who killed him by hanging him on a cross. If you're wondering how painful crucifixion is, it's where we get the word excruciating yep. from. Once Jesus died, there was darkness. And the Romans had, it was one of many things that the Romans borrowed from people that they had encountered or conquered, uh, was crucifixion. It was a particularly horrible way to die, and that was why it was used especially on political prisoners, as an example to people, it was meant to be a, a really, really awful thing to, to have happen to you. And one of the soldiers was like, uh, guys, I think we just crucified the Son of God. I think there was a prophecy about this. So Jesus totally could have stopped this from happening, so why didn't he? Well, you may remember, everything kept failing because people kept sinning. Jesus was the only one who didn't sin, so he made a sacrifice for sin to solve the problem of sin. And people realized Jesus was indeed the Messiah, or the Christ. Jesus was buried in a tomb. On the third day, some women came to visit the tomb and found the tomb empty. Then Jesus appeared alive to the women. Then Jesus appeared alive... And this is a big deal, uh, that the, the biblical story tells us that women are among the first to see him alive. Because in this culture, at this time in history, the testimony of women was not admissible in court. And so if you're inventing a story you don't use women as some of your key eyewitnesses unless that's actually what happened because it doesn't carry 
any weight in terms of convincing people of your case. After the disciples, Thomas had his doubts at first, but then he believed and realized Jesus was God. So they all worshiped Jesus because they realized Jesus was the chosen one who defeated Satan. He defeated Satan by defeating death when he rose from the dead. And Jesus ate a fish to prove that his resurrection was physical. Then Jesus gave them the ultimate Bible study, explaining how all the scriptures were about him. He was doing this to train them to build the church. Holy and that's why in John's gospel, he starts out by saying, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The word meaning Jesus, the the the. the that Jesus was the living word of God. In other words, you have the written word of God where God explains the nature of God and the, his relationship with his people. But then you have Jesus who is the living embodiment who, who lives that out so we can see what that looks like in a human life. Hold up, why do we have to do this? Isn't Jesus going to start his kingdom now? Well, Jesus said it wasn't for them to know when that was going to happen. But for now, the church is the kingdom. And he commanded them to baptize people all over the world and convert all the nations. And with that, Jesus ascended into heaven, but he promised he would come back one day. And in the meantime, he sent the Holy Spirit to empower them to build the church. So now Jesus is in heaven, but it's not like he's gone. He's ruling over his kingdom from heaven through the church. And when he comes back, he's going to bring heaven down to earth to redeem it. You know how Jesus rose from the dead? He's going to raise everyone from the dead on judgment day. He's going to throw Satan into hell finally. And he's even going to throw death into hell so death won't exist anymore. Mm. And we can finally eat from the tree of life and live in a perfect world forever. So why does everything exist? It all exists for Jesus and for his kingdom. He's going to conquer everything and make all bad things good. The question is, do you want to be a part of that? All right. So that was a pretty good portrayal. Obviously, there's so much more to the Bible than all of that. But if you're making a 16 minute video, you're kind of summing up the most important parts. I think that was a pretty good portrayal of what the Bible talks about. Again, this is a history channel, so we're not here to debate religion one way or the other. It was really just more of a, a look at that. And I would love to do a similar look at the Quran at some point because I don't really understand a lot of the Quran. I don't know it real well. So if you've got any recommendations uh, as far as a good video that kind of lays out the key parts of the Quran, I would love to look at that as well because I think that's also important to history. Um, keep in mind, if you do post something with a link, uh, links don't automatically get approved and show up in the comments. I have to go in and approve those. It's a way of preventing spam and porn and things like that. But I will go in and approve those if you post a link with a recommendation. So um, I want to give a shout out and a thank you to Logan in, I'm going to assume it's Cologne, Michigan, rather than Colon. Although in Michigan, who knows, you know. But thank you, Logan. And Daniel in Herndon, Virginia, thank you so much for your support on Patreon. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.